So, hello everybody. Um, today in this video, we're going to talk about a prolapsed intervertebral disc or PIVD. So, the intervertebral disc consists of three distinct components the cartilaginous in plates right here, the annulus fibrosis that surrounds the nucleus pulposus. So, you can see in this picture right here. So, here we have the nucleus pulposus that's surrounded by the fibrous annulus. The nucleus pulposus, it's uh, derived from the embryonic notochord and it's a gelatinous material that is surrounded by a ring of fibrocartilaginous tissue called annulus fibrosus. And the term prolapsed disc means protrusion or extrusion of the nucleus pulposus through the hole in the annulus fibrosus. So normally, the nucleus pulposus is confined within the annulus fibrosus but if this herniates out of its position through the annulus fibrosus then we call it as prolapsed intervertebral disc now there are some sequence of changes that leads to pivd and they are so let me explain this through this picture right here so in first, at first we have this stage of degeneration where the uh, nucleus pulposus gets fragmented or degenerated along with the annulus fibrosus. So the annulus fibrosus also becomes weakened. In the stage of protrusion, uh, the fragmented piece of the nucleus pulposus uh, protrudes out of the joint space and uh, it's known as prolapsed disc. Uh, in the next, we have the stage of extrusion where the prolapsed uh, disc, it comes in contact with this posterior longitudinal ligament, but it's still, uh, it is in contact with the parent disc, okay? So it has not completely lost its contact with the parent disc and this is known as extruded disc. At last, in the stage of sequestration, the fragmented piece of the nucleus pulposus comes out completely and it uh, completely loses its contact with the parent disc and it's known as sequestrated disc. Now after that, we have the stage of fibrosis or the stage of repair. In this stage, the residual nucleus pulposus becomes fibrosed along with the extruded nucleus pulposus which also becomes flattened and fibrosed and later on it undergoes calcification and this can lead to some symptoms. A few things to note here is that the usual or the most common site of exit of nucleus is the posterior lateral part of the vertebra and the commonest level at which the disc prolapse is seen are L4 to L5 and C5 to C6. L4 to L5, it's because this is the most weight-bearing part of the vertebra and C5 to C6 is because these are the most mobile areas of the vertebra. Now let's talk about some secondary changes that are associated with the disc prolapse. At first, we have the uh, changes in the structures that occupy the spinal canal. Now we know that spinal cord runs through the spinal canal and there are several roots, the nerve roots that come out of the spinal cord. So when there is prolapse of the disc, then there is there can be compression of the nerve roots that are arising from the spinal cord. And the nerve roots that arise from the lower part is affected. Like uh, if you look at an example, if the disc prolapse is between L4 to L5. So, okay, so if the disc that is present between the L4 and the L5 vertebra. If this disc uh, it uh, prolapses or it protrudes out, then the nerve root arising from the L5 is affected, whereas the nerve that's arising from the L4 is not affected. Uh, the pressure in the roots of the cobra equina uh, by a sudden large disc prolapse may present as cauda equina syndrome now we know that uh, in the distal part of the spinal cord there are some uh, tuft of uh, nerve roots that's coming out and this part is known as cauda equina because it has it gives an appearance like that of horse tail so when uh, the disc 
prolapse. When the prolapsed disc compresses this part of the spinal cord, then this can give rise to uh, cauda equina syndrome. Now there can also be changes in the intervertebral joints. The loss of part of the nucleus pulposus and its fibrosis can lead to loss of height of the disc that can affect the posterior facet joints okay so if we come back to this picture right here you can see uh, there is this intervertebral disc and when there is loss of or the prolapsed intervertebral disc then the height of this disc it's reduced and with that the uh, vertebras they come down like that and if that happens then the facet joints that's uh, present posteriorly then this joint is affected and when there is pressure in these joints the cartilages uh, that are present within this joint are uh, gets degenerated and this can lead to degenerative arthritis now on to the diagnosis the ct and mri uh, confirm the diagnosis but we can also look uh, this disease from the clinical view so this disease can present with some clinical features such as low back ache obviously this is a disease of spine so there is a back ache which may be acute or chronic and the movement is very painful due to spasm of the spinal muscles and this pain can radiate down the back of the leg which is known as sciatica or we can also describe it as sciatic pain and it's due to compression of the sciatic nerve by the prolapsed disc. The nerve root of the sciatic nerve is L4 to S3. If the sciatic nerve is compressed at the level S1, then the pain radiates to the posterior lateral calf and heel. But if the nerve root is compressed at the level L5, then the pain radiates to the anterior lateral leg and the ankle there can also be some associated neurological symptoms such as paresthesias which is usually described as pins and needles now under examination we look for posture which is a rigid flattened lumbar spine as you can see in this picture here and so the, the lumbar spine it becomes flattened which is usually described as loss of lumbar lordosis or the whole trunk is shifted forward on the hips you can see the trunk is shifted forwards or the trunk is tilted to one side you can see the trunk is tilted to one side which is described as scoliosis the movement is restricted due to spasm in the paraspinal muscles and there can be diffuse tenderness in the lumbosacral region as well now some special tests can be done to diagnose the pmvd one of them is straight leg raise test slrt or stretch test so in this test uh, the patient is asked to lie down on a couch and uh, his affected leg means the leg where the pain is felt is lifted up gradually with the knee straight so the knee is kept in extended position and the hip is uh, lifted up and the patient complains of pain or stretching at the back of thigh or the calf not in the knees if there is presence of uh, prolapsed intervertebral disc okay so uh, if the straight leg raise test is positive at 40 degree or less then this is suggestive of root compression um, let me explain here if this is the bed in which the patient is lying and if the leg is raised like that keeping the knees extended and if you measure the angle between the uh, thighs of the patient and the bed and if it's 40 degree or less than that then this is suggestive of the root compression and when you perform this same test on the contralateral side or on the unaffected leg and if the patient feels pain or if the test comes positive then this is highly suggestive of disc prolapse and there's something called brogat sign or the reinforcement positive so in this case what you do is that uh, when you raise the leg of the patient and if the patient uh, feels the pain or when the uh, straight leg raise test is positive then you gradually lower down the leg 
to a point where the patient feels no more pain at all and at that point and keeping the leg at that point when you dorsiflex the leg then the patient will again feel the pain and this is known as braggart sign and presence of braggart sign aids in the diagnosis of the prolapsed intervertebral disc now there is a, another similar test which is known as Lasicki test and it's a modification of SLRT and in this test unlike the straight leg raise test the knee is actually bent okay so the knee is not extended the knee is flexed and then the hip is lifted up to 90 degree and after that the knee is then gradually extended and uh, if the patient feels the pain then the test is positive now coming on to the investigations ct and mri are the diagnostics and we usually don't do x-ray to diagnose the pivd because it's not seen in the x-rays however we do it to rule out any other bone pathologies now in the, under the treatment section the, we can do um, conservative treatment where we tell the patient to take rest especially on hard bed for not more than two to four days or we can also give them drugs such as analgesics and muscle relaxants to relieve from pain or we can also ask them to do physiotherapy to increase the range of movement there can be operative treatments uh, which is uh, especially indicated when there is failure of conservative treatment or when there is called equinus syndrome or when there is severe sciatic tilt the techniques for operative treatment are fenestration laminotomy hemilaminectomy and laminectomy now there's something known as a chemonucleosis so in this technique an enzyme known as a chymopepain uh, which has the property of dissolving the fibrous and the cartilaginous tissues so this enzyme it's injected into the disc and this enzyme will dis dissolve the fibrous disc which is actually causing the problem here so when this fibrous disc is dissolved then there will be relief of the symptoms so that's it with the prolapsed intervertebral disc thank you